So as long as I don't get too many, um, God, um, something is making it look yellow. Anyway. <laughs> okay. That's better, I think. I still look a little yellow. I think it's the shirt. My microphone. I'm, I'm having a little trouble. So I'm going to go as long as so I don't get little the little warning that tells me my um I make sure I'm doing this in the right yeah Penny Ann um double check to make sure I'm on the right account okay because <laughs> I being out here and when I'm on my other family like not family but just I don't know who on my other regular account I have a couple people on I was on the wrong account and I'm like I wonder who those people were um look my lips to me look yellow something's wrong um I um, it was a little awkward getting ready because today I'm having a hard time controlling the muscles in my arms, my right arm, and my left hand. Um, like it's like this when I'm trying to push like the X or something. bounces around and, and I have to just sort of lunge at it hoping I get the right thing <sighs> anyway my and this was something I wanted to talk about um, I have a, a neurologist appointment February um, 15th I think um, to to assess that and tell me what that it probably is the essential tremor um, but so I had been in a really dark well, not dark mood wise, but just deep depression, you know, the drill. Um, I'm looking for, um, I, and it took a couple days this time to like get my head above water, which, there we go. Um, which I feel pretty normal right now. I, I think I would have been more productive if um, this muscle thing wasn't bothering me. Um, because before I would just just spit out projects and um, now, sometimes I want to do the projects and I'm feeling motivated, but um, I'm concerned about, about messing it up because I have to do some detail work with glue and, and, and anyway, and I keep telling myself, trying to reassure myself that it's not ruined. If I get a little glue, I can always fix it. I have to remind myself that, but I have some nice things coming. And so that makes me feel a lot better. Um, 
And today I was adventuring in Discord. Um, and that's a circus. <laughs> that is crazy. Um, I went to a Harry Potter one. Just I wanted to get used to the format. It's insane. It, it must be a generational thing. Oh, the times back when we, we had message boards and yeah, blogs and um and everything, email and everything was in slow motion. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, how do you, or have you ever had to, how do you feel when you have to go to the doctor about something other than your psychiatric disorder, and you have to go to a doctor, and especially a specialist, because for some reason, I think they mention them. Um, do you feel um, like they're going to judge you or automatically put you in the category of, well, you can't, it's not physical this is, it can't be physical it's got to be it's going to be in your head your disorder your psychiatric disorder i had a super bad experience once and it tainted every future moment i had at a doctor or nurse practitioner, nurse, just whatever. Um, and I'll tell you uh, how it went down. I suddenly one evening started experiencing very sharp shooting pain right in my temple. And... Um, It ended up being, I had the kind of insurance back in the 90s where you had, uh, it was Humana, um, and, it, you know, you had to go through your gateway doctor to see a specialist. And I thought that because I was, um, at the time, healthy and young, I didn't need to worry. I would just need to, you know, um, yearly pep smear, whatever. And um, so I, I start having this pain and it was really weird. And I was a registered nurse and I knew it was not normal. I didn't know what it was, but I know that people don't walk around with sharp shooting pain, pain that doesn't go away. And, um, it ended up being this battle with this um, gateway doctor, my primary physician, um, to get any care. I was treated for so many different things. And uh, um, sinus infections and, you know, because it would travel on here and blah, blah, blah. Um, And they would give me, you know, after a while, you know, they would give me Tylenol, Tylenol with codeine. And it's not like that. You got to, there's something wrong. You got to fix it. <laughs> you got to fix it. And there's something wrong. Months and months go by. And I'm like, finally, I was like, I, I'm going to see a neurologist. You are going to send me to a neurologist. And I just insisted. 
Um, but yeah, so, well, before I went, he told me, me, he said, well, this is before I was diagnosed with bipolar. I had, at the time, I had a history of depression at times. And so he told me exactly, well, sometimes people with depression have these kinds of pains. It's not that you're not feeling the pain, but there's no physical explanation for the pain. And like, I almost was but like across the room and strangled him. And, and like, it, it is not psychosomatic and you're crazy. And I'm going to see a neurologist. He's like, you don't want to go. They're going to send you to a neurosurgeon. They're going to want to do surgery. You're going to have half your face numb. And it's like, this guy, I think this guy knows what's wrong. And there's something very fishy going on here and so this is like a year later and I could only change insurance at certain times and so I go to the neurologist and they do an MRI and he does an exam and asks me questions and he looks at me and he says he said you have this neuralgia Try, try geminal neuralgia and he said no it's and it's a real he looked right at me and he's like look at me it's a real thing it's a diagnosis and i'm like he must know something i don't because he's acting really strange and so um so i went back to my prime Mary doctor feeling vindicated and before I said anything he says to me yeah you know the neurologist agreed with me about this thing being part of your you know recurrent depression and I was like you're <laughs> you're a liar you're a liar he sat there and told me to my face what it was. So I had to suffer with these people until I could change insur insurances. And I go to my new doctor ASAP. She sends me to this neurosurgeon ASAP. It's not even two weeks after I get the new insurance and I'm in his office and he's doing the assessment, your typical neurological assessment, you know, nose thing and look up, look down and whatever. And he's in the middle of it. And he just casually mentions that I have a history of depression. And I thought he was going to go there. So I just started to sob <laughs> uncontrollably. And he, um, He was like, whoa, whoa, what, where is that coming from? And I explained to him, I said, well, I thought you were going to tell me that this was all because of my depression, like the other doctor, like my other doctor did. He's like, no, no, you have trigeminal neuralgia. There are treatments for it. Um My primary doctor had already tried a couple of the most common drugs and it wasn't helping. I couldn't tolerate them. I couldn't tolerate them. And, um, and I ultimately had surgery where they put, they made little holes in my skull and put a camera in there and discovered two blood vessels wrapped around the nerve. And what happens is over time, the pulsating and stuff of the blood vessels wears off the nerve's protective sheath, and it makes the nerve get confused and weird and send out pain. <laughs> and so they put these tiny Teflon 
pads between the blood vessel and the nerve. And it was immediately gone. I was like in the, in recovery. And I was like, this is awesome. Yay. And I didn't, I would forget that I even had had it 10 years away. I'd never felt it again. Um, 10, about 10 years is what they give you for that surgery. And, um, to be honest, every time I go to a new doctor, I, except for a psych doctor, um, I expect to be treated differently than like after I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I expect to be treated, I, I expect to be to not be taken seriously. That's how I go in with my, that's my expectation that I go in um, with. And um, which is because of that experience. I, that I'm not going to be taken seriously and um, they're going to blow me off. They're going to think I'm a problem patient or that I'm crazy. I mean, and, and to be honest, I don't particularly like the word crazy, but there have been times in my life where I did qualify properly under the term crazy. So, I mean, I wouldn't you know, but even there's a line in, um, it's in the book, The Hours and the Movie, the character of Virginia Woolf. Her sister is visiting and there was an event, a birthday or something. And the sister did not ask Virginia if she would want to come. And she's like, why didn't you ask me if I wanted to be there? And she's like, well, you, you know, you weren't up to it or something, which was true. And she said, well, even crazy people like to be asked now and again, something like that. And, um, we're just, you know, I always have the feeling that the doctor is standing outside the room or the nurse and they're looking at the paper before they can, they're right on the other side of the door. And the second they see bipolar disorder on there, they are going to, Cha they change I expect them that they change like turning a knob a notch and how they're going to approach or even take in the information that I'm trying to give about what I'm going through um, to try to feed everything through my bipolar disorder. I imagine it's a natural thing to do, but that means a lot of us uh, go untreated or we don't go to the doctor at all because um, we're afraid of being judged. And they don't have to even say anything. I mean, you could just see it kind of, you know, they, they go over your, I don't know, sometimes you just sort of, it might be in my imagination. It might be my expectations I'm putting on other people. But I'm like, as soon as they see bipolar disorder, they're going to 
be listening a little less. They're going to be considering what I have to say a little less. They're going to take me a little less seriously. Um, so um, I imagine there are a lot of us that I wonder you know, how persistent you would have to be if you knew something in your heart to be true um, and to be the case and be dismissed every time you go to the doctor, um, you would have to have a pretty strong uh, will, a pretty strong sense of yourself. Um, depending on where you are in your mood state, you know, I mean, I, another example is um, women experience heart attacks differently than men. And um, their symptoms are different. And there were, there turns out, there are a lot more women out there having heart attack um, and they're just getting a volume and sent home. <laughs> you know, so we're, that's a, that's more of a sexism type thing. Um, but it's similar in that, I mean, do you think, um, You know, like, I also think that I take a lot of medication. Are they automatically going to think, um, I'm just looking to be on more, more medication that I'm there to, I don't, I don't like taking a lot of medication. I actually start plucking things out and get and get crabbed at from the doctor because I don't like because I feel like if I have this long list, people are going to be like, "Wow, that's a lot of medication. She must be cr crazy." Um, but some of the medication is to take care of side effects of the other medication. Um, and anyway, I, I, I have also, which is doubly bad, I have had, this is b before, you're on a lot of meds. Yeah, I got a lot of issues, so... <laughs> And half the meds are to take care of side effects from the other meds. And yeah, that that pisses me off too. I'm like, I don't want to be on a lot of medication, you know. And, and if I could function, I don't take anything unless it's something that's going to keep me from functioning. You know, if I function less on that med, I'm not taking it. I mean, I mean, unless it's a heart medication, but yeah. And I was going to say if, if, and it depends on the psychiatric medication that you're on. If you're on a lot of, um, like benzos and stuff, like, if you're on um, Xanax and or um, what is the one I just tried and I couldn't take it because I hallucinated, but uh, the anti-anxiety ones. Um, when they see that. I mean, that's, that's a double whammy. Um, 
th then they think you're not only crazy, you couldn't possibly have anything physically wrong with you because you have a site because all people who have psychiatric disorders automatically everything is caused by that psychiatric disorder. Not only that, but because yeah, clonazepam. Um, not only that, they're taking these uh, meds, these benzodiazepines and um, anti-anxiolytics, however you say it, anti-anxiety meds. You know, they're of course you're going to feel funny. <laughs> and I'm like, and if they see that you're on a lot of that, I mean, they don't like think they don't think maybe there's a reason I know that we have a problem with um, people abusing meds and stuff but there are people out there who have to take medication and um People who, I mean, I guess these are doctors that have never seen a panic attack. I mean, long term, long periods of anxiety affect your body and your physical health. Um, I have been taking, I can say Xanax better than the generic form um for years many years um i usually only need it at bedtime and in the event i have to speak um in front of people some situations um yeah and um so if if I don't take that bedtime Xanax, I don't fall asleep. And if I don't go to sleep, if I don't sleep, my moods are off the charts. So give me a break. And um, I think that I the, there is a judgment definitely before they even walk in the door when they're looking at the maybe when they sit down and they're looking at the little folder but they see those meds those type of meds on there um i i think they automatically assume that you're someone who refuses to deal with life and and refuses to just um, buck up and deal with it and get through the hard places. And I'm like, have you ever seen, have you ever experienced a panic attack? I actually have more, I get panic attacks in the car, but I usually have more of a anxiety, like social anxiety, storming anxiety. Um, but my brother had panic attacks. So, I mean, oh my gosh, he would get sweaty and shake and cry. He would just sob. And um, it was painful to watch. And the more depressed he got, the less things went well for him and the more anxiety he had. And his world closed in he became agoraphobic because of other circumstances as well, but um, 
pretty much everything put them in a tailspin of anxiety. And how can you judge and deny, you know, deny somebody, not deny them the meds, but deny them the compassion to acknowledge that it is a thing. Now, when I go to my psych doctor, um, I don't feel the same way. You know, they ask me how I'm doing. You know, meds are the same. How are things going? Um, do we need to make any change? They, they ask me. <laughs> do we? Do you think we need to make any changes? You know, I come in every three months if things aren't going well sooner. You know, um, and they're they know that. that I was doing well on a certain regimen of medication, and I went through a very difficult time that caused me a lot of anxiety and distress, and it was messing with my bipolar disorder and anxiety issues, and I was prescribed um, a little more. You know, of one as need, two as needed. And we tried clonazepam, but it was a wild ride. I felt really good, but it was a little dangerous when I was hallucinating that there were, my dog was in the back seat and he wasn't. <laughs> and um, and we tried extended release Xanax. And instead of lasting 12 hours, it lasted 16 hours. And it made me see when I take Xanax, I don't even feel like I've taken something. I don't feel high. I don't feel lightheaded. I don't feel tired. All it does is relieves uh, the mess that is just freaking out in my head and it eases it and slows it enough for me to, to take stock and figure out what I'm supposed to do next or to break out of a repetitive behavior or, you know, and it doesn't, it's not like I'm getting high. I would like to tell that to all of my, every doctor and every nurse that walked in a room with me. I'm not, not getting high. <laughs> I don't, I don't like that feeling. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I've tried them. I used to drink when I was young, but I just never liked the feeling of not being in control of my own body. And, um, but the dosage that I take um, is appropriate for my disorder and where it's at right now. And my psych doctor has no suspicions <laughs> or, you know, she just wants to treat my disorder. And, um, and when I go into a neurologist, they're going to want to treat whatever branch of medicine they're in so but when they see the bipolar uh, um 
I just worry, you know, and I have that appointment coming up. <clears throat> and then I'm like trying to figure out, you know, it's probably if, if this doctor is trying to figure out what's going on with me with um, tremors and motor issues. I figure it might be important to mention the fact that I had ECT. And I think it was the like early 2000s. And you might think it weird that I can't remember when, but that's because I had ECT. I can't get messed with my memory. I have chunks of my past just it's gone, just swept away. And I'm like, well, I did have a psychiatrist that I really liked. I did end up liking her, but she made me feel self-conscious when I mentioned having had ECT. And I will tell you why. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I have to drink so much water because my mouth gets dry. <laughs> and then I... Anyway, um, I was in a bipolar depression. And, and you probably know what that feels like if you're listening to this or have seen it. But um, for a year, if not more. Without let up. It was awful. It was awful. Um, my moods used to be so long in the beginning. And, and um, so I was desperate. And a doctor brought up ECT and there was nothing else. I had tried all the medications and um, I just wanted it to end. And um, they were saying how it's, it's not as bad as it used to be. They only do it on one side and it was awful. It was awful. It should be. I mean, there are people who do argue against me and say it was the best thing that ever happened to them. And, and I think it should be outlawed. <laughs> um, I, it, it, it was awful. And so in like 2000 teens, I had started going to a new doctor, psychiatrist, and I mentioned the ECT, and she said, why did you let them do that to you? <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, thanks for not being judgmental. <laughs> um, I was desperate, and, um, and I don't... The, I'm not sure if you have bipolar disorder, but if you've been in a depression that long, you're going to do anything to get out. So I have this appointment with this um, neurologist for a hand tremor, hand tremors, and um, my right arm doesn't want to move right. <laughs> it's like cooperating with my brain. Um, we pretty much know it's just, I want to say just, um, essential tremor because my father has it and his two sisters have it. And I'm just going to throw this in here real quick. His two sisters, they, well, he has it in his hands, arms, and his throat. And so his voice is really difficult to understand and um, his sisters have it in their hands, throat and head. Really it's the neck but it makes the head bob 
So there may be a time when I can't talk or my, I'm too conscious of my head bobbing around, you know, um, because I found out that pretty much just women get the head bobbing thing. So, um, excuse me. So I'm pretty sure he might want to know that I once had ECT just to be thorough. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how the heck am I going to bring it up without feeling like th this person is going to judge me. I think I already know it's a woman. That makes me feel better, but it could be a false feeling because women can be just as judgmental. And, um, I mean, I guess I should, I, I will probably, and I probably can't take my Xanax, I probably shouldn't take my Xanax before so they can, because I know that there will be like things that I have to do, um, for diagnosis wise. And, um, so I don't know know maybe i'll make sure my mom comes along <laughs> um i don't know that my service dog is allowed in there it's like a hospital medical center in the city um i guess i should i can call and find out um but my mom would have to come too so so that someone could hold him. Um, so, yeah. Uh, um, I feel like I'll probably be judged on the ECT thing. And um, I'm going to get one of those arms and, like, mount it here so I can, like, it could be like the be like the ones on TV and move it while I talk. <laughs> um. Anyway, so I'm a little anxious about that. I'm a little anxious that I am not gonna take Xanax. It's gonna be early. So early in the day, and um, and and I'm worried about I'm worried about um the exam being appropriate because both lithium and seroquel can affect your motor. So how are we gonna know? If my hands aren't shaking from the lithium and my arms jerking from, because that's what I thought it was, but I was told differently. <laughs> um, all these years, I thought it, the arm and stuff was from the Seroquel. I thought it was the uh, like tardive dyskinesia popping through. But when they heard about my dad and his sisters, the di everything changed. Um, and, and I already tried a medication for it called propanolol, which they sometimes use for anxiety and performance anxiety. And, um, we had talked about me being on that and, oh, that was awful. That was, um, it was just, it was just like being in a bipolar depression very flat and dark like and no motivation but add water retention to it <laughs> and, and so I took it for a week and I decided that the side effects were worse than the symptoms 
at this time. Um, and then I found out um, just yesterday from my dad that he had been on that medication for the tremors and the same thing happened to him. It made him feel absolutely miserable. So he stopped taking it. And the, the most common other option is another benzo, but I don't remember which it is. So I don't know. Um, I have, it, it affects, does affect things I like doing. Um, my mouse, controlling my mouse is sometimes difficult. It like jerks over to the side and trying to get the little arrow on the X and click it. Sometimes my hand spasms and I click on stuff and, um, this was a while ago, and there were things on the sides of the site I was on, and my hand, like, spun over and spasmed, so I clicked on this website I did not want to click on, and I was getting some really bad pop-ups for, like, three months, so um, that was fun. I can't use coffee cups because I throw them. I literally, my arm spasms and I like throw the coffee cup I, across the room. So just thought I'd share that. Um, yeah, so I'm anxious about being judged. Um, I have to get up early. It's like two and a half hours to get there. I'm going to make my mom drive. I'm not good in the morning. And um, um, so that's a while from now. So I don't really need to be fretting about it. I'm more, I'm, I'm more worried about being, this is sad. I'm more wor worried about being judged and uh, um, um, being misdiagnosed because of my bipolar disorder than I am than them saying, yeah, you have this or something even worse. And even though it is essential tremors considered benign, they he said that's kind of a false labeling because it's progressive. And um, so I'm actually more worried about being judged than being told that you have this neurological thing and it's progressive and it's only going to get worse. And we can't tell you how fast um, or how bad. <laughs> so that should tell you something about the uh, health care system and uh, people with psychiatric disorders and uh, what we have to worry about just going to the doctor. And, uh, yeah. So it's pretty late. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go now. I hope you have a good night or or a good evening or a good day wherever you are at and um, I'm gonna go get ready for bed okay good night